the evolution of getting to open? Yeah, I, think I left Cervelo in uh, May of 2011, so then I had to figure out what to do next. And uh, of course, over the years, we talked quite often about mountain bikes and about some design ideas, but we always decided with Cervelo it was better to stay focused and really do the road bikes and the triathlon bikes very well, and time trial, and not go into mountain bikes and, and other things. So this sort of gave the opportunity to try and do something in mountain bikes and at the same time just, you know, stay out of the air as a Cervelo because I, you know, I wasn't in the mood to be a competitor for Cervelo because I, I love that company obviously when you build something up together for 15 years uh, there's, uh, there's some pride there. So um, yeah, Open was really the opportunity first of all to try something new on the, on the product side. Of course you know, I had no, uh, no previous mountain bike designs to my name. And at the other side, also to do something on the on the way the company is structured, because obviously I've learned a lot in 15 years. Some things I like, some things I don't like. Mm -hmm. This was an opportunity to. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the business model, I mean, after 15 years of Cervelo, of course we've grown into a fairly large company, and I realized that that's not really what I enjoy doing. I think Phil was a lot more comfortable with that than I was. And so, you're learning that thinking that you know, small is beautiful and trying to keep things simple really has, the, has its advantages. So the goal was to build a company really in a mold of how we would like the company to, to look if we started from scratch. And so Andy and I decided to be just the two of us. Um, and when did you and Andy come together to? That was uh, a couple of years after I'd started, so but in the summer of 2011 I was talking to him about what I was doing and he was very interested and uh, he was looking for some new and exciting uh, challenge so he decided that hey maybe we should work together on this and it's a good fit because he's a very operational guy and lots of sales experience and I I can't stand sales and I'm not that good at operational so I'm more on the, on the engineering and design side um, so it, it was really a good fit from personalities and, the, and a skills point of view and it allowed us to keep it very simple to people and sort of run the whole gamut of what was needed for him. I mean, I, I, you know, I've ridden mountain bike regularly since uh, I really started about 10 years ago. Uh, so on and off, and usually when injuries came around it was off. But, uh, so n yeah, not professionally, I haven't uh, had any influence in it, but professionally I've never ridden the road bike either, so I don't think that's necessarily a, a detriment. But there again, it's a good combination. I come up with crazy ideas and Andy tells me it won't work, and then sometimes I agree or sometimes we try it anyways. And so I think there's a, a good dynamic there as well, because there is an advantage to looking at something fresh without all that baggage, but of course uh, knowledge and experience accounts for a lot as well. So I think there, that, that's a good combination to do us. And in the design of this bike, what were your biggest technical challenges? Well, um, that's a good question. Nobody's asked me that question, which is kind of strange. But I, I think in this case, uh, the cable routing was important because there's, of course, now hydraulic brake or hydraulic shifting, which is just coming out. Electronic shifting cannot be far away. You know, if we can do it on road, we can do it in mountain bikes, and it makes a lot more sense in mountain bikes given the situation you find yourself in. So, for sure, electronic mountain bike shifting is coming, and we didn't want to make a frame, but then would be obsolete after a year because Shimano says, "Tada! Here's the new XDR electronic." So, yes, we wanted to find a way to make a frame suitable for mechanical, but also hydraulic and electronic shifting. And then it quickly thought, that, well, if you want to protect that well, you want to do it internally. So yes, the, the internal cable routing and how to make it ready for something that doesn't exist yet, that was uh, certainly one of the challenges. Well, I mean, it's, you cannot unlearn what you've learned, obviously, and uh, it just makes a lot of sense on a road bike, just as it does on a mountain bike, that you put a lot of diameter and a lot of material in areas where you need stiffness and strength, and in those areas where you don't want stiffness, you take the material away and you reduce the diameter. So, and on a road bike as well as on a mountain bike, the seat stays is a prime example of that. You don't need a lot of material there to get torsional stiffness. You don't want any vertical stiffness, so you try to keep them as small as possible. Uh, now, those dimensions and those shapes are different for a mountain bike than they are for a road bike because the forces are different. 
but the principle is the same, and so the look is not not dissimilar in that sense. Right. Sorry, yeah, that's part of trying to keep it simple. So uh, one wall is about as simple as we could uh, we could do. I mean, zero would be the simplest, but that doesn't last very long. So um, and what we said to ourselves is like, okay, do we want to do a second mall or maybe a third mall? Maybe we certainly don't want to have a whole enormous range, and we don't think that's necessary. You'll never see us do, you know, downhill bikes or something that's just too far away from from, from the people we are. Um, is it possible that we'll do a full suspension bike? Yes, it is possible, like a short travel full suspension. But we're in no rush for it. Like, because the company is so small, we can sustain ourselves, you know, at a, at a normal level with this one model. So we're, we're not in the rush. So we'll come up with something, be it full suspension or a new hardtail or whatever it may be. Once we feel we're, we're right and we have something that's that's worth making. So that could be six months from now, that could be six years from now. We, we really don't know until we, we found that. that one thing that we like. One of these ways of trying to keep things simple is also that we don't do sponsorships, both because it takes a lot of time for us and because we know that we just cannot give the support to athletes that they deserve if they, they are sponsored by a company. So we're trying to just sort of steer clear of the more traditional ways to, uh, to promote the brand. Uh, we also think that um, you know, it doesn't really it's not really that meaningful for the average mountain biker that there's some guy who can ride very fast on that bike. Uh, I think in sponsorships, you know, on the road, but also in mountain bike, everybody understands how it works. Uh, you offer the most money, the guy will ride your bike, or the gal. So but there's nothing wrong with that, and certainly good exposure, and you get logo exposure, and you get, you know, it's fantastic, and it works. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily what our customer is waiting for. That's not the endorsement, maybe that they're that they're waiting for. I think they're more looking for endorsements from their peer group. So. We spend a lot more time talking directly to customers and, and helping them in their uh, in their decision making, which might end up with an open or with something else. And it's not a nice thing about being small. You don't need to get every sale you can get. You can just give people the advice that we think is the best. And, uh, and that seems to work quite well. We see a lot of people who recommend the bike to, to others after they've purchased already. And we've only been selling for a couple months. So, so we think that's more valuable if, if you know a, a normal uh, rider recommends the bike to another normal rider than that there's some you know incredible athlete who happens to be winning races on it. The conversation with the customer are a lot less visible. Of course there is the blogs and people can comment on that and people ask questions directly on the site and we answer them so people can see those questions and answer but there's the part you don't see is where people either through Twitter or through email uh, talk with us directly and we, we you know we, we have these conversations and so yeah you see that um, I mean I think our very first customer um, was riding the bike and he used a, a, a type of housing that we hadn't tested with so we'd done SRAM and Shimano and you know, the regular ones but he bought another sort of no-name brand of housing and you found that the, our cable stop sort of shredded the housing in a way and so you know this is something that we hadn't figured out but our very first customer happened to figure it out so you know these are just small conversations that are happening and then you know 30 days later there's a little cable stop that we inserted into the head suit we redesigned and reconfigured so that it would now also work with those types of housing and in fact it also helps uh, even people who use SRAM or Shimano housing so these are small conversations that are happening that we wouldn't necessarily see on an average style company because you know you wouldn't think you would necessarily get a reply so a lot of customers wouldn't go through the trouble of, of making their small concern known you know which isn't life-threatening in any ways and they would just live with it but because they know that we want to hear from them you see that a lot of people take the trouble to uh, to report back to us any issues they have and then when they see it gets resolved in the 30 days they get a new set of cable stops and it's that we've listened and we've made that change of course that encourages them to you know give us more feedback so I think it's something that's not really visible in any way but it's helping us a lot and it's, it's helping also those individual customers and in the end everybody who benefits from a, an improvement like that so the one thing we would like to do is if, if we want to talk to our customers then we need to be able to visit them and if we have 500 stores worldwide it's going to be very hard to visit them regularly so our idea is to have roughly 50 stores so then you know I can visit them like tonight here at Libby Chiclada um, and so yeah that's definitely part of the plan and, and I think also I mean the type of product that we have we don't need to be in every store so um, there's there's a couple sides to that so there's the fact that we can now visit these stores if we only have 50 or 60 worldwide as the fact that this means we can be very picky about which store we work with 
because as I'm sure you know as well, there are a lot of lousy stores in the world of bicycling and there's a couple of really good ones, so this gives us a chance to just cherry pick the best ones. And I think that in the end, in both of those benefit the, the customer.